Good evening, friends. Hope all are well and everything's going good and that you're enjoying this beautiful Sunday. It's certainly been a beautiful day for us, and we're thankful to be with you again tonight. Uh, I want to just mention as people are coming online what the scriptures are that I'm going to be specifically looking at. There's always a few more than I can get into, but I'm just going to share a few of the key verses. And maybe someone who's come on early could write these down and post them so that new people as they're coming on will know what scriptures we're in. So tonight I'm going to begin in Psalm 94. Psalm 94. Then I'll be over in Genesis 2. Then I'm going to be in Isaiah 55. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So uh, just real quickly again, Psalm 94, uh, Genesis 2. Isaiah 55 and then 1st Corinthians chapter 1 so we love you we greet you in Jesus name and uh, thank you so much for all the wonderful comments and just the uh, even private messages and things that I've gotten it's such a rich thing for me to know that we're together so I'm gonna invite Patty to uh, pray for us tonight hey welcome to Car Church and Jesus is Lord, and I see Jesus in you. Those of you who may have gone to Mike's college group at Mount Perrin remember him saying that many times, but I wanna say we do see Jesus in you through your encouraging emails, your text messages, your cards, your letters, your kind gifts. Thank you so much. We're all in this together. We love you. Now let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that all that we have comes from you, and you give us richly your word. You speak to us tonight. Open our ears so that we can hear the things that you have to say to us. And anoint Mike tonight and give him wisdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. She's a good prayer. So tonight I want to begin in Psalm 94, if you have your Bible and your notes with you. And uh, I'm going to share a message tonight. I'm calling it The Brilliant Blindness. And I think as we go through this evening's teaching, you'll understand kind of what the focus is and why I chose that as a title. And uh, I pray that this, as we go in to this teaching tonight, that your heart will really be open to consider the really profound implications of the things that we're going to discuss. Because I know for me, the Lord has really had me pushing back towards the issues that are root issues. There's so much fruit right now, both good and bad fruit out there. But the Lord's really had me pressing back into the roots of what the real causes are of the things that, that are going on in our world right now. So let's look at Psalm 94, and we're going to begin tonight in verse 11. And the, the psalmist is writing, and he says, The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. But blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law, that you may give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off or abandon his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment will return to righteousness, and all the upright in heart will follow it. I want to begin with this really profound statement that is made here in verse 11. It says, The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. You know, the word that's used here for futile in the Hebrew text, it means emptiness. It means transitory. It means unsatisfactory. It's kind of a picture of vanity of vanities, like the psalmist uh, spoke about, rather, uh, the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes speaks a lot about. It's a picture of a short-term solution for a lifelong problem. In other words, something that's, as we've talked about before, kind of trying to put a Band-Aid on a broken arm. 
This is the picture of futility. It means something that's ineffective, something that is unsuccessful, something that doesn't work. It's something that's unprofitable. It doesn't accomplish its intended purpose. Well, notice that the Bible says that the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. In other words, they're empty, they're transitory, they're unsuccessful, they're unprofitable. The thoughts of man are non-productive in the end in accomplishing the purposes that they're set to. Now, this is a really critical idea, especially in the days in which we're living. We need to understand something about the nature of mankind's thoughts. God says the thoughts of mankind are futile. I want you to notice what he doesn't say, and listen to me carefully about this. He doesn't say that the Lord knows the thoughts of man are stupid. Now, what, why do I say that? Because my topic tonight is the brilliant blindness. And what I want you to think about with me for a moment is that the scripture does not say the thoughts of man are stupid. It says the thoughts of man are futile. In other words, the thoughts of man can be brilliantly futile. Let me try and give you an understanding of what I mean when I say that. Imagine, for example, that I'm a military commander and I am plotting a strategy for a military action to attack the enemy uh, in order to head him off before he accomplishes a hostile purpose but in my strategy which is a brilliant strategy to defeat the enemy there is something left out of my strategy my intel is incomplete as a result I go and attack the enemy where I think he is and what I find is was something done in World War II is I find blow up tanks that are made of air and I find parachutists that are actually toy dolls. Why? My strategy was brilliant, but it was futile. Because I didn't have the information I needed to have. It made my thoughts non-productive. It made them unsuccessful. It made them incapable of achieving the purpose. They may have been brilliant, but they were brilliantly futile. I think this is important to understand because the scripture does not indicate that man is stupid. The scripture indicates that man is blinded and that he is able to brilliantly come up with ideas, brilliantly come up with solutions, brilliantly come up with perceptions but in the end, they prove to be brilliantly futile because there is a brilliant blindness in the heart of man that makes his thoughts futile. He doesn't have all of the information he needs, and so his strategies do not succeed. Now, this is true of us as a race of men on planet Earth, but it's also true of us, each one of us individually. Our thoughts, absent God's thoughts, are futile. And they end in a non-productive solution that does not accomplish its purpose and cannot achieve what the intended result was. Now, this idea that the deepest problem of man is not stupidity. In fact, I want to suggest to you the deepest problem of man is brilliance. Man is so brilliant because he's created in the image and after the likeness of God. His mind, when I say this, his mind is so capable 
of coming up with ideas and coming up with perspectives and coming up with ideologies and coming up with isms and coming up with solutions to problems. His mind is so active. There's a brilliance to the mind of man. And yet, the Lord says this brilliance results in futility. Get that in your spirit for a minute. Here's why. Because if you think that the Bible says that man is stupid, then when you hear a man say something that has a lot of brilliant ideas in it, you'll think there must be something wrong with God's perspective on man. No, trust me. There are many brilliant, futile ideas. Because there is a brilliant blindness to the heart and mind of man. Now, the question then becomes, if it's true as the Lord says, the Lord knows, the Lord knows, he's intimately acquainted with the fact that the thoughts of man are futile. Why is that so? Why are the thoughts of man futile? And what is the cause of that futility in the thinking of man? Well, to understand that, we have to go back to the book of Genesis in other words, the genesis of the futility of man's thinking goes back to the book of Genesis, which means beginnings. And when we go back to the book of Genesis, we find something that happened to the thoughts of man that brought in and introduced this concept of futility. And it's a very familiar passage, but I want us to look at it maybe a little differently for a moment. The scripture says in Genesis chapter 2, and verse uh, 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Of all these trees that were in the garden, God pointed out only two, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I want you to notice something with me for just a minute, because we're going to look at the temptation that happened. But I want you to notice that God did not say to man, this is a tree that will make you wise. God did not say to the man, this is a tree that will open your eyes and understanding. God did not say to the man, even that this was a tree that would produce knowledge. He just said that if you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Something is going to die. You're going to spiritually be cut off from my life if you eat of this tree rather than of the tree of life. Now, in chapter 3 of Genesis, we see... The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, verse 1, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice he's already lying. Because God didn't say, He said of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But he says, Did God say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it nor shall you touch it lest you die. Eve added something God didn't say about touching it. But then in verse 4, it says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, a direct contradiction to the word of God. And then notice what Satan says, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desiring, desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband and they ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they introduced the first religion of man, the church of the fig leaf, man trying to fix his own problems. And they sewed the fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now I want you to notice this. The Bible tells us that Satan is a liar He's the father of lies, and the Bible says when he lies, he speaks his native language. That's John chapter 8. Satan is the, a liar, the father of lies. All lies find their origin in him, and when he lies, he speaks his native language. So lying comes naturally to Satan. Well, notice the lies that Satan told 
Adam and Eve, he told them, God knows in the day that you eat of this tree, your eyes will be opened, that you'll become like God and you'll know good and evil. In other words, you're going to become all wise, all knowing. But I want to suggest something to you. What God told them about this tree is only one thing. If you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Satan convinced Adam and Eve that this tree was going to open their eyes, going to give them a knowledge and an understanding, give them insight that God was keeping from them. But in a sense, when they ate of this tree, the action of eating of this tree revealed to them the difference between good and evil. And from that point, their eyes were opened to a natural understanding. Their minds were enlightened to a natural process of thinking. Their perception was now bound to a natural view of the world. But in a sense, instead of their eyes being open, their eyes were blinded spiritually because they had chosen to disobey the clearly revealed Word of God and chosen the deception of the enemy and darkness over the revelation of God and His light and life. And the result was they were kicked out of this relationship with God and now man was thrust into a place, really, a place of darkness, not a place of light. He had come under the power of the prince of the power of the air. You know, it's interesting the things that we see about Satan. Here is Satan, the prince of darkness, and he's offering them light. Here is Satan, the enemy, the arch enemy of God, and he's offering for them to become like God. Well, the Bible says they were already like God. They were created in his image and after his likeness. But Satan is confusing and deceiving them. And most importantly, here we have the father of lies, and he's offering or suggesting to them that he's the one who has the real truth. All of this leads man into a deep, deep darkness. And man is thrust out of the garden, and now the revelation of God has been replaced by the information of the adversary. And where man before was receiving insight and light and truth, now it was replaced by human, uh, you know, mind games, by the workings of the human intellect, by the interplay of mind and will and emotion and passion within man. And the result is that his thinking because it was not in alignment with God's word, became futile. And his plans, what were Adam's plans when he ate of the tree? To become all-knowing and all-wise and become like God. Well, guess what? That was a futile thought because that's not what happened. Instead, he became blinded. He became darkened in his understanding. Isn't that what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1? professing themselves to become wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of God for creatures. And the Bible says God gave them over to a darkened understanding and their foolish hearts became darkened, not enlightened, darkened. Such that their thinking, though brilliant, men can come up with some extraordinarily brilliant conceptions but in the end, they're futile. In the same way, as we're looking at the world right now, and I want to say more importantly, as you're looking at your life right now, as you're looking, like, looking at how do I cope with what's going on? How do I react to what's going on? How do I respond to what's happening? What, what do I do with these, these conflicting ideas and these conflicting emotions and these conflicting thoughts? And, and I'm going to listen to these thoughts for a while. And then I'm going to counterbalance them with those thoughts. And then I'm going to go back and listen to this again. And we're just consuming, consuming, consuming so much information. And may I say, may I say many of the arguments are just absolutely compelling. They're very, you know, they're very intelligently presented. They're very systematically laid out. There's so much information, 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 information. 
But the question is, is all of the information that's out there, is all of this information coming from God by the way of revelation through his word, or is it coming out of the futile thinking of man based on the compilation of human information, leaving out the most important dynamics? Let me suggest to you that just because we have the mind of Christ doesn't mean we're always using it. And just because we have the Word of God doesn't mean we're always consulting it. And even at times knowing the Word of God does not mean we're acting upon it. You know, when the Scripture says Jesus speaking, that there were two men, one built on rock, one built on sand. Winds came, wind, uh, rain fell, storms came upon these homes. One fell, one stood. What was the difference? We tend to think it's that one heard the word of God and the other didn't hear the word of God. But what the scripture says is one heard the word of God and put it into practice. The other heard the word of God and did not put it into practice. Can I tell you that man and God think very, very, very differently? I want you to look with me at Isaiah chapter 55. Look at Isaiah chapter 55 with me. And if you look at verse 6, Isaiah 55 verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And then notice what he says in verse 8. Now really you've heard this so many times before but listen to this. Receive this and understand it. God says in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Get this with me. God is saying, you don't think like I think. In other words, you are not by thinking going to be able to come up with my thoughts. You are not by your brilliance going to come up with my solution. You are not by your consideration, your debate, all of the works that you're doing, you are not going to get my mind and my thoughts by solical, which is mind, will, and emotional, and passion, by those operations of the flesh, you're not going to arrive at either my thoughts, nor are you going to arrive at my ways. And he says, just so you understand just how big the gap is between my thoughts and your thoughts, and my ways and your ways, he says, I want you to consider how high are the heavens above the earth. Now think about that for a minute. How high do the heavens go beyond the earth? That's how different, God says, your thoughts are than mine. And your ways are than my ways. You see, when man ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he became intellectually and emotionally and volitionally and passionately awakened and with that all of the all of the extraordinary gifts of thought and emotion and and creativity all of those things came alive but they came alive absent the word of god and absent the ways of God, and absent the thoughts of God. 
such that with all of this extraordinarily creative activity and all of this extraordinarily eloquent and systematic and intelligent and brilliant consideration that man can come up with out of all of his universities and out of all of his all of his gatherings of intelligentsia and all these things they cannot with all of their searching they cannot arrive at the thoughts of God or the ways of God let me prove that to you in scripture I want you to look with me in 1 Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 18 Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Corinth and he says I want you to understand something about the ways and the thoughts of God and notice what he says he says for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God for it is written I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent notice he says he's not calling these people stupid he's they're prudent they're wise but their wisdom and their understanding I'm going to destroy because it's futile look what he says in verse 20 where is the wise where is the scribe where is the disputer of this age listen this is an age of dispute God says where is the disputer of this age has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And now notice what he says in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. In other words, God says you cannot know God through human wisdom you can't know his ways you can't know his thoughts you cannot grasp his understanding it and even if you could if you look over first Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 notice what he says he says in first Corinthians 2 verse 14 but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit they are foolishness to him nor can he know them for they are spiritually discerned now go back to our original premise in Psalm 94 God says to us the church God knows the thoughts of man that they are futile not that they are stupid but they are ineffective in affecting the change that man yearns to see you and I yearn to see change I'm telling you I yearn to see change in this world so desperately I yearn to see a different world than the world we're presently living in but here's what I know I can't rely on Mike Atkins thoughts to get us there I can't rely on my wisdom, I can't rely on my eloquence, I can't rely on my, my perceptions, my perspectives, my thoughts. It doesn't matter how brilliant, how well educated I can be, the thoughts of man absent the thoughts and the ways of God are futile, absolutely futile. Listen, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people over the past hundred years have lost their lives following following brilliant ideas that were futile why were they futile they were futile because they were based upon a problem inside of man now this is a scripture I didn't give you but the Holy Spirit's telling me to have you turn there just real quickly which is to the book of Romans and I want you to see something about Romans chapter 7 in Romans chapter 7 we find the problem with the solutions of man and the problem follow me just a moment here the problem is not that the solutions are stupid some of them are let's be honest but it's not always that the solution is stupid as a matter of fact 
the Bible says there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is perfect. The problem with the law in its ability to effect change is not the law's imperfection. It's us. We're the problem. Look what it says in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7 and looking at in verse 12, it says, Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. But notice what he says, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I am sold under sin. For what I'm doing I don't understand. For what I will to do I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. You see, the problem with the solutions of man is man. The problem is not we haven't come up with a more brilliant solution. There's nothing more brilliant than the, than the law of God. But the problem is man, man is broken, man is fallen. Man has to be redeemed. Without the introduction of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, man cannot understand the law of God, nor can he obey the law of God. It's only by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus entering into the heart of man that the, the, the impossibility of human flesh can now fulfill its promise by the power of God at work in man. What man needs is not reformation. What man needs is regeneration. What man needs is not another good idea. What man means is a power to redeem, to heal, to forgive, to cleanse, to come into and transform from the inside out the human heart. And the thing is, man doesn't come up with that idea. No, no strategy of man is going to result in man coming to say, I do not have the answers. I am without hope and without God in the world. I cannot solve my own problems. I desperately need the redemptive power of Jesus Christ to transform me. Man doesn't come up with an idea like that. That idea came from God. That's why the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. He sent his son in the world to redeem the world, to, to call the world unto himself by the most extraordinary act of love ever expressed in all of universal time. And once an individual comes to understand this and comes to embrace it, then the futility of man's thoughts and the brilliance of man's ideas and the eloquence of man's speech and all of the works that man comes up with now become recognized for what they are. They may be brilliant, but they were operative on blindness. The brilliant blindness of man. Oh, my heart is so full of this theme right now. The brilliant blindness of man. Saints, we are... We are watching the world's explosion of debate, of consideration, of ideologies, of isms, of perspectives. The, the, the world is, is exploding with knowledge. As the book says in Hosea that in the last days, information or knowledge will increase. It's increasing in knowledge, but it did not say in the last days wisdom would increase or truth would increase. It said in the last days knowledge would increase. How do we arrive at truth? Jesus did not say you shall know more stuff and the more stuff that you know will set you free. He didn't say you'll become more brilliant and the more brilliant you become the freer you'll become. What Jesus said is, you will know the truth if you are my disciple. A disciple, the Greek word mathetes, it means to sit at the feet of another person and learn. Jesus said, and the Bible says, Jesus was the word made flesh. 
Jesus said, if you will become my disciples, sit at the feet of the word and learn, then the word that you learn from me is what will begin to set you free from the futility of man's thoughts without God. And let me tell you something. Let me remind you this. You're not going to stumble by accident upon the thoughts or the ways of God. Because they are so much higher than your thoughts and than your ways that they rival the depths and extension of the universe, infinite universe. You can't figure them out. You can't find them by searching, 1 Corinthians said. You can only know them by revelation. And the revelation has been given to us in God's word. God does not talk like you talk. Because God does not think like you think. God does not act like you act because God actions are different than your actions. God doesn't see things the way you see them because God sees from a spiritual perspective and only by the Spirit can we ever understand that perspective. You know, the Bible tells us something about the spirit of man. It says the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all of the inward parts. Notice it does not say the intellect of man is the lamp of the Lord or the emotions of man. It says the spirit of man, that part of us which is recreated, made alive in Christ when we accept the sacrificial death of Jesus, we are born of the spirit, born from above, spiritually made alive. It's in our spirit that God puts his light, a lamp, is where you put a light. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. And that's where he puts his light. Well, how does he do it? Well, the Bible says the entrance of thy word gives light. When the word of God comes into the spirit of man, it brings light into the lamp of our spirit. And it enlightens us with a revelation that we could never in a million years with all of our brilliance and all of our investigative skills and didactive uh, reasoning, we could never have arrived at what God can reveal to us by his word. The problem is, even when we read his word, we have a tendency to still choose our brilliance and our information over God's revelation. I'm seeing it. This is a pastor talking to a family. I'm seeing it in the church right now. I'm seeing a lot of people saying things that I know are not the things God would say. I hear a lot of wrangling and debating and expressing, expressing sometimes in a very unchristlike manner, a lot of attitudes flying, a lot of flesh flying, but it is futile because it's not finding its origins in the word and the mind, the heart and the spirit of Christ. And the result is it will not, it may be brilliant. Your argument may be brilliant. But is it the revelation of God or is it the information of man? We can never fully comprehend all that the Lord is accomplishing or doing. His ways are so far beyond, Paul said, searching out. They can't be searched out. They must be revealed to us by his word. My, my goal is, and my calling is to read the word, understand what the word says, and then act in congruence with the word, regardless of what I think, regardless of what I feel, regardless of what I want to do, regardless of what I feel passionate about, all of those things 
on their own produce futility. That's why Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. But he said the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. When we come to that understanding of the Word of God entering into our human spirit, bringing a light to the lamp, and taking the futility of man's thoughts, putting them underneath the, the superior revelation of the Word of God, we exchange a brilliant blindness for a humble revelation. There are so many things that I can say over the course of my life God has used to humble me when I let go of my brilliant strategies, my brilliant ideas, and my brilliant thoughts that were blinded because they were absent the most critical information necessary for my thoughts to be effectual and that was the Word of God. When I go to the Word of God and I read it, at that point, listen to me, if I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, when I read the Word of God and I see a clear instruction and command of Scripture as to how I'm to speak, how I'm to treat people, how I'm to act, how I'm to respond, at that point, what I feel, what I think, what I want to do is irrelevant. What matters is what God's Word tells me to do. And the obedience to that is what moves my thinking from futile to fruitful, from non-productive to successful, from profitless to profitable. That's when God is able to use me in the world to bring a different and completely unique perspective into a situation that would never be solved by man that way. You know, I want to go back now just real quickly to where we began in Psalm 94. And I'm wanting to draw to a close. But I want you to notice where we began is the Lord knows the thoughts of man that they are futile. But notice what he says in verse 12. But blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and you teach out of your law, that you may give him rest from the days of adversity. Can I tell you that we're living in days of adversity, difficult days, darkened days, days where there's a lot of confusion, a lot of pain, a lot of heartbreak. There's a lot of things going on. But the scripture says, when I move away from the futility of the brilliance of man, and I move under the authority of the Lord, and I allow him to begin to instruct me, him begin to teach me out of his word what I am to do, how I'm to respond, what I am to speak, what I am to accomplish, how I'm to approach things, and I become strictly and fully committed to doing it his way, regardless of what I think or what others think or what I feel or what my will wants to do. I become committed to not just hearing his word, but to building my life on it, acting upon it. When that happens, he says, I begin to get rest from the days of adversity. Why? Because I'm not caught in the malastrum and cacophony of confusion of, yes, brilliant, intelligent, but futile thinking. And he says, until the pit is dug for the wicked. The word here for pit, and I don't want to go too deeply into this, but what it, it literally means is it, it means to lay a trap for the wicked. And the word wicked, we tend to think of it as just 
you know, terribly evil people. But the word wicked means to be twisted. It means to not be as it's intended to be. It means to be out of sync with its original purpose. If I take something and I twist it, then I've bent it and it's no longer useful. Well, the scripture says that when I come under the word of God, I'm now in a position to be taught at the feet of Jesus, to understand his thoughts, not mine, his ways, not mine, to let the revolution begin in me, to become a, a complete surrendered member of his kingdom, be transformed from the inside, do what he says do, act the way he says act, not listen to my thoughts, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight, not wicked or crooked. Now he says, when you do that, you'll get rest. There's a lot of us that are troubled, a lot of us that are restless, a lot of us that are lacking in peace. The word brings peace. The word brings understanding. He says, if we'll do that, we'll be in a place of rest while the Lord is setting things up for those who don't know him. In other words, we'll become lights, not one more voice of cacophonous confusion and angry, passionate reactions. But we'll start to become centered and at peace and at rest from the confusion of the age and rest from the adverse times we're in. And then the Bible says, verse 14, for the Lord will not cast off or abandon his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment will return to righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. In other words, he's declaring that if we will abandon our thoughts and come to his thoughts, we'll abandon our ways and come to his ways, we will stop being mesmerized by one more generation of brilliant blindness and futility. And instead, we'll come to his word sit at his feet, let him teach us his thoughts, teach us his ways, discover how different he is than we are, commit ourselves to letting his life be expressed through us, rest will come to our spirit, and while the Lord is exposing the futility of the world, we will not be following its futility. Instead, we'll be there ready to introduce the thoughts and the ways of God in the midst of the struggles and the problems that are going on. You know, there's one more thought that I want to try and close with and and then I'll I'll complete our time together tonight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it tells us that the gospel in verse 3 is veiled it's veiled to those who are perishing. And then it says this, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The Bible doesn't say that Satan in the garden brought light and enlightenment and wisdom to man. It says that he blinded man to the things of the Spirit. The actions of man blinded him to the thoughts of God, the ways of God, the perspectives of God. The last scripture I want you to look at with me is in Luke 24. In Luke 24, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Jesus has appeared among the disciples. They've been hearing him preach for three, three and a half years now. But do you notice that Jesus said a lot of things to the disciples before they were born of the Spirit? He said things to them like, there are so many things I want to tell you, but you can't receive them now. 
But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you to the truth, and he'll bring to your remembrance the things that I've spoken to you. You see, Jesus understood that even the thoughts of his disciples were futile. It was Peter, remember Peter, who said, Lord, I rebuke you for saying you're going to die and go to the cross. And Jesus said, Satan, get behind me, because you do not think like God thinks. These are not the thoughts of God. God has sent me here for this. We have to have the Word of God to know the thoughts of God to be able to respond to the world around us in the Spirit of God. Notice what it says here in Luke chapter 24. On the day of his resurrection, he appeared among his disciples. He's speaking to them about what was written in the Law and the Prophets. And then notice what it says in Luke 24 verse 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Supernaturally, by the breathing of his life into the disciples, he now opened their spiritual eyes to see what they couldn't see before, to think what they couldn't think before, to have the perspective they couldn't have before. And in a sense, I want to say he's yearning in these days to do the same thing again in the church. He's given us his spirit. We've been born of the spirit. He's given and placed within us the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We have the mind of Christ, but are we letting the mind of Christ be in us? Are we going to his word and saying, Lord, what is my response here? Or are we reacting out of our brilliance? I'm telling you, I see a magnificent brilliance and intellectual sparks flying, but I see a lot of futility. What would happen if instead of our brilliant blindness, we exchanged it for a humble revelation, a teachable spirit that comes to the Word of God and says, Lord, show me what your plan is. Show me how I'm to react. Show me what my steps should be. Not let man's ideas captivate me and pull me along. But what does your word say? And what am I supposed to do? Sometimes what you're supposed to do can be a very small act. But that small act, when it is thinking God's thought, and acting in God's way may cause a ripple effect that you have no comprehension about. Whereas all of the brilliant strategies of man may move armies and resources in order to accomplish things that when we get there, we find the enemy is actually over here. And we have brilliantly, blindly acted futilely to try and accomplish what God's thoughts would have rescued us from. I want to close now in prayer. And I'm trying to pull us back to the roots of our faith, to the roots of God's ways. We're in a critical culture. We're in a debating and fighting and struggling world. How desperately the God, God needs a group of people who will enter his rest, come out of the adversity around us into that place of his word, and then become conduits of the fragrance of Christ and the peace of Christ and the wisdom of Christ in a world choking on its own brilliance. I want to end in prayer. Lord Jesus, take the words that I've spoken and I pray the words would be in sync with your words and somehow settle them in our thoughts and in our hearts. Lord, help us to realize the futility and the shallowness of effectual outcomes based upon man's thoughts and his ways separate from God. Help us as the church, Lord, 
not only to have the mind of Christ, but to let this mind be in us. To let your word awaken in our spirit a new flame of revelation that expresses a new hope in a world that is hopelessly lost in its own strategies. And help us, Lord, help me, help my brothers and sisters be that light in these days, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and much love to you all. Thank you for this time together. It's a rich treat for me to spend this evening with you and many blessings this week. Take the time to re-listen to these things, chew on them. I pray the Holy Spirit will speak to you. God bless.